you would start to size up people. Like if you're into these bands and hey, you're definitely gonna want to check out this. And that's how all the descriptions, I always tried to write those freaking labels. I got like carpal tunnel from doing that all those years, but just like, hey, if you like this and this, this is what you should be into. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s New Jersey punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. If you grew up in northern Jersey and needed a place to find independent music, you would either go to Scotty's Record Shop in Morristown, Sound Exchange on Route 23, Hot Topic in the Rockaway Mall. Yes, you could actually find some, some bands there, some music there. Or you could take a ride down to Pompton Lakes and visit Flipside Records, where you would run into Alan Rappaport, who would be manning the register. He opened people's eyes to bands like Sicko, Discount, Plow United, Mineral, Jawbreaker, and Jimmy at World before they were making videos about underwear or pool parties. My friends and I would pile in our buddy Lucha's car, drive to Flipside, and use whatever money we could find to stock up on new music. I wanted to get Alan's perspective on the scene back then, and he said, totally down, man. And this is what we talked about. Who actually kicked him out of Elaine Meyer? Disney World's effect on his punk rockness. How he started working at Flipside. Introducing Donuts and Glory to Steve from Right Turn Eddie, his Luau pool parties that included Discount, My Pal Trigger, and Less Than Jake, his relationship with Jimmy Eat World, the backstage rehearsal studio, and a ton more. This week's episode is sponsored by Southern Tier Distilling Company. Building on 300 plus years of Western New York spirit production, Southern Tier Distilling Company puts the heritage into every bottle. Now expanding their market to New Jersey, Delaware, and Ohio, more of us can enjoy these premium spirits such as Southern Tier Distilling Company's Straight Bourbon, Silver Medal Award winning vodka, Smoke Bourbon, and their 2X Hopped Whiskey, a whiskey distilled from their gold medal winning 2X IPA. In addition to their spirits, also available are their premium canned cocktails. Soon to hit the market are the gin and tonic with elderflower and cucumber, the bourbon smash with ginger, mint, and lime, and the vodka madras with cranberry, orange, and chamomile. Great for camping, the beach, tailgating, and the golf course. Check out Southern Tier Distilling at stdcspirits.com and follow Rob at southern underscore tier underscore nj. Tier is spelled T-I-E-R, in case you didn't know. Southern Tier, why the hell not? I also want to use this platform to promote my new book called I'll Eventually Like Kids When They're Older. It's a collaboration of comics that I draw daily on my Instagram account. If you want to check that out, just go to Your Daily Bread, or do a search for Your Daily Bread, or you can go to yourdailybread.com or whatever. I'm selling the book right now on Amazon for $18.99. That includes shipping if you're a Prime member. It does not include shipping if you're not. The whole book is just a bunch of comics that I draw on the daily, like I said, from my Instagram account. I chose about 80 comics and put them in this book. It's a real fast read. It's a great coffee table book, bathroom book, or a gift for your friend, gift for yourself, gift for your grandmother, and it's just a gift in general. Again, you can go buy that at yourdailybread.com. You could also go to thiswasthescene.com. I have a link for it right there. Or you can not buy it at all. Whatever. As always, thank you for the people who've donated to the podcast. If you'd like to do so, just go to thiswasthescene.com and send whatever you'd like. It's a big donation button on the top of the page. It helps me with the 20 bucks a month to keep this thing alive, and I also have merch there, uh, so you can go check that out as well. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who you know would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Now, I always said I said I always have said it as Alan Rappaport. Yes, that's very fancy sounding. So, so that, I don't think it's it's much less um, Rappaport. It's just Rappaport. Okay, for it, yeah. We're, we're we're working class people. <laughs> um, so the the interview has started, and uh, um, if anyone was buying records in 1990, well, you'll tell me, but I'm guessing when we started coming to Flipside, it was 97 ish because we just got our licenses around then. Yeah, and I was I was told there would be no math, so I'm not going to be good on <laughs> dates, but I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> it's it feels like a lifetime ago. That's all I could tell you. It's no holds barred, man. Um, cool. But yeah, Alan, I'm going to talk to Alan today because Alan used to work at Flipside, and he was, to me, and a lot of people, was a huge staple in the scene. And uh, he's, his name has been mentioned quite a few times in interviews, and that triggered me to go, oh, shit, I, sh I should reach out to Alan. <laughs> awesome. And, um, 
He was also in a band called True Zero, and he has a record label called Pop Kid Records, and he is the, uh, he had a stint in the Lane Meyer for a minute, but I don't want to talk about that because that's boring. I want to talk about <laughs> his stuff. <laughs> no, t- tell everybody how you kicked me out. It's awesome. <laughs> I want to hear this. Was it me or was it, was it Sean? Yeah, um, I guess we're going to start with this. I really, I don't know. It was kind of like, it just kind of happened. I think we, there was never a conversation like, Hey, you're out or we're done. I think we just, we parted ways. I think actually, I think Chris did it because we cause Chris felt bad. I mean, I'm <laughs> like, an, well, I didn't if feel he bad. did it, he did a shitty job because he never actually said, Hey man, you're out. Okay. So anything. that sounds like Chris did do it then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, later I got to tell you about the time when, uh, I started playing with him in like another project. And he would just, he'd show up to practice with a 12 pack of beer and totally forgot his guitar. So it's like good times. Good yeah, times. that sounds about right. And Chris listens to pretty much all of these episodes. So he's probably like, wow, great. Thanks guys. Yeah, no, he's all was, adult now and has like the responsibility and he's like super organized. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll believe it if I see it. I haven't <laughs> seen him in eons, but it's just, it's not the Chris I remember. Again, like, you know, I haven't seen a lot of you guys for, for eons. Mike, I saw you recently, but like on totally unrelated stuff. But yeah. so my memory of everyone in the scene is still frozen you know, circa 90, whatever. So it's crazy to think that, yeah, people have grown up and, and matured and, and gone oh, yeah. on with their lives. Oh, man, at the show, I mean, people were bringing their kids. It was crazy. They're yeah, I did. Kids. I saw those pictures. That was awesome. I, haven't, I I got two kids as well, and they haven't yeah. been to a punk rock show yet. Yeah, so. you have Ollie, and you just had a little girl? Yep, uh, Penelope. So Penelope. Super cute kids. Oh, thanks. I am partially yeah. responsible. So. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> nice, nice. I'm, I'm, and also, I'm trying to get them, you know, into to punk rock. And like, I've been playing them songs I've been recording, saying like, "Hey, you can make music. It's cool. Like, you, you want to write a song? You do, You can do whatever you want. You don't have to play any instruments." Yeah. Which is, I th- which is, I think, uh, how we all got started in it. Like, you don't need to know music. You don't need to know how to play anything. Just pick it up and wail. Yeah, exactly. Or I think the reason we all started is because punk rock songs or punk, you know, quote unquote punk rock stuff was very easy. It's three chords. And if you had a bass, you just had to do mm-hmm. one, you know, one string at a time. And if you had a guitar, yes. you just need the power chords. And that was pretty much it. Yeah. Well, you got started from about from the angst, though, right? The angst against the man and the state trying to keep you down. Yeah, you, you know. needed to just rise up above, above it. That, yeah, that was me at uh, 14. I was like, man, <laughs> I'm really out there in the world, you know, just seeing how this, you know social social pressures of uh, the government are you know fucking me up. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny though. Like we joke about it, but when I I got into punk rock and I got into I was always more into the poppier, the catchier stuff. Yeah. So I really even in like a punk rock world, I felt like an outsider. Because, yeah, you know, I'm from the suburbs. Like, I'm not really, you know, full of angst. I got along with my parents. Yeah. (laughs) Like, so it was just, it was weird. And then, um, I guess, pop punk kind of got huge. Uh, Green Day and all these other bands. And it was just like, all right, I guess it's it's, it's cool. We we don't need our, I don't need a spike jacket and a mohawk. I can still be a freaking weirdo with the rest of these guys. <laughs> well, I mean, that was the the difference. I mean, I, I can say punk rock as many times as possible in these these interviews, but I think I think I mentioned before that there's the there's the guys out there, the girls who were into the real crusty punk, and they're like, that's not punk, or or you know, I think maybe they're not as angsty now, and they're like, yeah, it's a, it's different. But I mean, what I noticed, what I called it, was punk rock because I think. I think it still held the standards of just doing your own thing and the DIY principles. And I mean, the music, some of the music, like Annie Flag, let's say, you know, those guys were against the government and they're still playing. I'm actually going to see them tomorrow, which is crazy. Nice. But they're playing with like Rise Against and uh, AFI, I think. But yeah, I mean, I get it. it and it's it's cool. Like I, I loved to, to me, it was the punk rock. It was just going to the show and everybody being super cool. Yeah. Like you, you were you were in an, your element and uh you know, you just you're up against a stage, listening to the people scream into microphones and, and play their best. So it was much more of that than I'm I'm here to kind of like, you know, raise my fist at the the government. <laughs> but I tell you, like I hope there's a punk rock resurgence right now, based on what's going on in in this country, because I am pissed off more now than I was as a kid <laughs> at this stuff. And I'm, yeah. It, if my hair wasn't thinning, I'd be doing my best to grow a freaking mohawk and start kicking <laughs> shit over. Man, I should do it. There should be an episode. If you're that much into politics and stuff, there's a Jay Jerkoff. He was very political. He is political. And then Sean Bergen, he is a buddy of mine who 
I haven't interviewed him. Uh, he was like a big fan of music back in the day, but we still talk. He is huge into politics and super smart about it. I think it would be hilarious just to like listen to you guys <laughs> just go off on shit for about an yeah. hour and just talk sure. about stuff. I don't know if I can keep up. I don't know if I'm super smart on anything that's going on. I just think it's it's insane. Yeah. But uh, but let's let's go way back. Yeah, I want to start. Was- <laughs> so what? Okay, well, like I said, we met when you were at Flipside. Now the the, the three things that I and I think they might have all started simultaneously or but there was i'm thinking it goes flip side true zero and then pop kid happened a little bit in between what was yeah. first um yeah i mean flip side definitely happened first um okay I, so like, but to start but to start though before we jump into flip side mm-hmm. uh, i ask this every time what got you into music uh what got me into music um yeah you know it's funny the the one creative force that got me into everything that I, I grew up uh, to be passionate about throughout my life, whether it was uh, music, photography, anything, is uh, Disney, believe it or not. And more specifically, Disney World. Okay. Super punk rock, I know, but hear me out here. <laughs> okay. Um, when I, you know, my, my family would go to Disney World, as I think most families do when you have young kids. And something there resonated with, with me. There was, there was smells, there were sights, there was the music of all the attractions. And I kept wanting to like, I wanted to capture that somehow. So I used to buy all the, they have these souvenir albums with all the songs from all the different rides, like Pirates of the Caribbean and uh, Haunted Mansion. And I would just play the hell out of that. And then, you know, I wanted, but I wanted to capture this magic, these feelings of when you were there. So I would always, even as a kid, I had like just crappy little cameras. I'm trying to take as many, many pictures as I could just because I wanted to bring that home. And, and I think that's what really started this in me as like a super young and, and even like cartoons and theme songs and stuff like that. Just these, these catchy short little melodies. That's fan- That's um, fascinating. Yeah, it's it's insane, right? I, I did some like soul searching one day and it I kind of started connecting all these dots because I'm even looking to my right. Now I've gotten rid of most of my records, but to my right there's like a handful that I saved and there's there's probably a split between like Disney records and punk rock records. <laughs> so, so crazy. But I I mean it, it it was a wild progression through my life. I had an older brother who was a metalhead, like total Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, like you know, it, played the double bass drum in his bedroom, long hair. And, uh, and growing up with him, you know, you, you look to your siblings to kind of for guidance as you're going through puberty and shitty times. And so I started listening to some metal and it was, it was weird. It was kind of good, but, uh, you know, I, it didn't resonate with me until I started getting into skateboarding and mm-hmm. all the skateboarding videos. And that's when the freaking epiphany went off, you know, um, minor threat descendants. Yeah. like i was like yes i am home like this shit is the best <laughs> and i just i went crazy from there so i forgot that you when when you were when we would sometimes go to your house and hang out and then you had you used to hang out with like um all the cky guys like bam margera and all them like back uh, in the day? no 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 not not directly like um, but you knew my... of them and you introduced them to us like just yeah. like the videotapes because you were skating with guys who knew them or there was some kind of connection to that yeah my my old like high school buddies um they moved off into wherever those guys live like philadelphia and uh yeah. they they hooked up with them so i knew i knew of them by extension and that was the extent of it. Yeah, I remember it was, you were showing a CKY that one time where it was when he's running through the golf course and he's got that long black jacket on, just like running and screaming <laughs> at these golfers. And it was yeah, the and, funniest shit. And later on, I'm like, wow, these guys are now gazillionaires because of that. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, my buddy always used to bring like random videos of just like crazy things that uh, were going on. And like, yeah, anytime like bands would come crash, we'd always put those videos on. So it was good times. And yeah, it was amazing. Like, oh, wow. Yeah, like my, I think one day it hit me when my parents started talking about it. They're like, do you know these people? I'm like, no, no, I don't, I don't, that's weird. I don't know any of those people. <laughs> but no, you know what it is? They actually recognized uh, my high school friends and that's how they made the connection. They're like, yeah, I saw him on this thing called like Jackass or something. I'm like, oh God. Oh my God. Wait, wait, did you ever skate with Tim O'Connor? Uh, I mean, if he's from New Jersey, the answer has got to be yes, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It was funny because I had a, uh, a couple of years ago, I was living in Morristown and my neighbor um, you know, I became friends with a bunch of neighbors and she was talking one time. She's like, yeah, my brother was in a skateboarding. I go, wait a minute. I go, O'Connor. I was like, wait, your, 
and she's like, yeah, my brother Tim. I'm like, wait, your brother's Tim O'Connor? She's like, yeah. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, awesome. That's crazy. She's like, yeah. Like they, I think they grew up in like Montville or something like that. And he used to always skate at Par Hills. And I always knew of the name, but I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. Yeah, that's but, awesome. Um, yeah, I should put a disclaimer at the beginning. Like my memory is, is shot these days. I'm I'm an old man. Everyone so. does, dude. Okay, trust cool. Me. They'll be just right. – you'll you're you're gonna at some point in this you're gonna be like oh my god i just remembered this one thing i i bet that happens because it happens with like everybody that i talk to cool i'm looking forward to it <laughs> i'm gonna let's bring get, back your memory to that nugget that i haven't thought of in like 20 something years <laughs> oh yeah that yeah what was so what was the like so was it was it minor threat or descendants that was like the band uh, it was that totally like, descendants because i, I you know I, I, I did probably what every punk rocker does when they start getting in this type of music. Like I bought Misfits stuff, Misfits cassettes. Like everything I was buying was all cassettes. Yeah. And, you know, like oh, I was like, OK, it just nothing really hit me until I started getting Descendants and um, a lot like the SST stuff and Cruise Record stuff. Like that's where I just lost my mind. Why? What, what was it about it that you liked? Uh, you know, it's like, I mean, they were. The, the the melodies and just like the hooks they had songs like Coolidge and stuff just like ruled my freaking world mm. like yeah, I, I don't know like it, it I, I wish I could put my finger on exactly what it was but the mo- the it it moved me yeah it got me up and I was just like pumped I'm like this is this is it I need more of this and that's where I started I started looking at the those labels I'm like what other bands are on there and I bought a lot of crappy stuff until I just started finding like more and more I uh, I used to work with this guy who um kind of is like i guess when i started working he's like me he was me then he was a dude who owned a record label and um you know he kind of turned me on to a ton of things i was like this young scrappy little kid like oh yeah like descendants he's like oh okay here let me let me check out a bunch of these other bands Ah, and um okay yeah yeah his name is lenny and he used to run a record label called uh buy our records which had like adrenaline od which is uh the only band i remember super awesome guy and, um, you know, there, there's two people that I credit for my direction in music. He's one of them. And the other is Tracy Wilson, who got me the job at Flipside. Um, so tell they, me. If, OK, OK. Unless you have some more. Because I, I, that's a great intro because I want to know how the frig that happened, because <laughs> that's definitely one of my, my, my questions. Yeah. You know, I, I wish I hear maybe this is the nugget that's going to come out. But uh I guess that's a terrible expression, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> like uh, I don't remember where I was in my life. I feel like at this point I, I was kind of spending a lot of time alone. Uh, I know I was I was going to school somewhere. I think like Morris County College. I had zero, like nothing. No, I, I didn't want to be in school. There was nothing I was interested in. I probably just wanted to skateboard all day. And uh, living, in Wayne, made, living in Wayne, New Jersey. Yeah, totally. Yep, <laughs> exactly. Yep, nothing yeah, going so, on. Nothing. So, um someone gave me a mixtape of, uh, some bands and there's some cool stuff on it that I had never heard before. And I happened to go into Flipside for the first time. And I asked, uh, the band was called tree people. Okay. And I, I remember asking Tracy, I'm like, hey, have you ever heard of a band called tree people? She like flipped her lid. <laughs> she was like, how in the world are you asking about this band? Cause she was friends with those guys. They were a, a band from Seattle. Like, how do you, how did you hear of this? How do you know of it? And by the way, yes, we have every freaking record by them right behind me oh my because God. yeah. So and after that, I just started going in there more and more and we, we just would hang out just kind of like you guys did, like everybody did and yeah. just come in that store, hang out, listen to some music. And that's what I was doing. I guess I was just coming in there like pretty much every day at one point. And this went on for maybe a year or two. And then when Tracy decided she was leaving, she was moving out of state at the time. I think I believe she said, Hey, I'm out of here. And, uh, Dan, the owner asked me to find someone to replace me. And I wanted to see if you were interested. So that's kind of how it went down. She just passed the torch and that's crazy. And I, again, I, I, I don't think I had any real kind of job back then. If anything, I was doing telemarketing or something super <laughs> crappy. And I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, because um, I thought that she was working there when you were there. when you said when she when you're talking the whole story, I, I th- for some reason it triggered that there was another that there was someone else there. But maybe I'm just not thinking no, no, right. Way back when it was Tracy and Jill were the they were the you know I don't know just, I almost said like two disc jockeys or something. What do you call people that sling stuff at record stores? Two people that work there. Sure. Yeah, employees. Yeah, employees. <laughs> there you go. I know it's, it's nothing romantic, but yeah, they were the two there. Um, 
there was a while of overlap where uh, Tracy would train me on um, things. Oh no, here are some good stories coming up too. But yeah. like the, the, the just the processes and the archaic methods that they use there. But yeah, she trained me for a while, and then uh, she split, and then that was it. Well, that's how we yeah. um, we found you, Barker. I mean, everyone you know, everyone listening, obviously, they're all from back then. But I mean, you got to think there was no internet, and it, even if there was, it was like shitty. It was Geo Cities or Geo whatever the fuck it's called, and Austin. Yeah, it yeah. was just a big piece of crap. So you had to drive around and just follow directions that someone wrote down on a piece of paper or you just stumbled across something. So I have no idea how Chris found Flipside. I'm sure he's listening and he's going to you know, text me how. <laughs> but he stumbled upon there with a bunch of the Jefferson kids where I grew up. And I think it was mm. maybe like him and Luch and like Andy or something. And, and then uh, he he came back. He's like, yeah, I don't remember the, I don't remember how, but he, he found you and you guys just started talking right away because remember he had started buying face to face and, and Pennywise and things like that. And I think you started guiding him in this different direction where it was kind of advancing on that. And, but you were like, yeah, but there's these bands like sicko and you know, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Jawbreaker is that, is that advancing on it? Well, jawbreaker. Yeah. No, yeah. sicko who I love. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I, uh, it's just funny. There but it, those were the bands that weren't in the thank you list of the, of Pennywise and, and, and face to face. Oh, like, sure. Yeah. They were so separate and they were smaller, but they were also big to us. Yeah. A totally different scene. Right. I mean, you had your fat records and your epitaph records, and then you had whatever that, that new wave was, um, just on all these scattered labels. So yeah, it was cool. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny though. And as you're saying this and thinking like, yeah, I don't know how people found the store. And, you know, I've, I've heard stories like, Hey, yeah, thanks for like, you showed me a lot of music, but I, I think it's, it's always been kind of the opposite for me. I was so psyched when you guys came in really? because uh, there was, well, not you guys, like <laughs> people, like don't get ahead of yourself here. You know what I mean? Cause there was so much downtime yeah. sitting there, like, you know, six days a week that once people came in who were like eager to, to check out new music and wanted to hear stuff. And I was like, those, that's the moments I was alive in the shop. The rest of the time, I was just like a sloth dying on some, <laughs> like, I think it was my, uh, like, prodigy dial-up connection there, trying to just, I don't even know what you did on the internet back then. <laughs> right? Yeah, we would come in and you would just be, I think, where was the, when you walk in the door, you were on the right side and you were yeah, well, like a, there was high a above of, us, kind of? When you walk in the door, there's a pile of shit on your left and then a pile of shit on your right. So... I don't know which pile you got I usually sat in the pile of shit on the right most of the time. The yeah. register was on the left. But I feel like weren't you like it was like it was kind of elevated to the rest of the store. Yeah, I think there was a platform so we could rain dominance down upon people. <laughs> right? Like that was the goal. Like look down upon everyone and their crappy music purchases. Was there no I I, I was talking to um this guy, uh, Mike Pilak, he was a couple interviews ago and he had said that he went in there and there was the free bin that you guys had. Do you remember the free bin? Vaguely. I can't imagine what was in there. Did he find something he, amazing? He found this band, this local band, High Strung. And Never heard of them. Weird. Yeah. They, uh, they, they uh, like Jeremy from that band, he ended up going into Humble Beginnings. Yeah, I'm full of shit, of course. Yeah, I know. I yeah. know um, but he, um, he said he went to the free bin and that's where he found that record and that's where he got into the punk scene was because that cassette tape was in that free bin. And I'm like, holy shit, I remember that. And now it just triggered, like, if you, you know, if you had remembered, been like, how did that start or who started that? But it sounds like you don't remember. The free bin? No, I think it was just probably, like, promos or demos or stuff that we would listen to. And just, you know, you don't want to throw that stuff away. So you just kind of tossed it in, in there. I think there was, like, stickers and random zines and stuff. Yeah, I think one of my things was that one of my goals back then is if I could present a band to you that you liked or you hadn't heard of, or you were like, Oh yeah, I felt like I won. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you were like really picky with bands. I felt. I was, yeah, I guess I was, there was like, there was this drum beat. We, I always used to call it like the lag wagon drum beat, yeah. which was like an instant. No, for me. <laughs> like once I started having that, doo -dah, doo -dah, doo -dah, doo -dah, I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's no good. <laughs> but yeah, I, I was probably much more of a snob back then too. You know, you, you're surrounded by music. You're constantly like hungering and, and 
trying to find new bands all the time. So I'm sure I was a bit of an asshole. So I apologize if that was the case. No, it wasn't. Like, it wasn't like some people were snooty about it and elitist, but you were mm-hmm. inviting, but you were kind of like, no, nah, no, nah, dude, like I, I get it, but you should really listen to this instead. And like, <laughs> You're like, yeah, I, I see you, but check this out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember Steve Weir, who was the drummer of, uh, he went to high school with us and he was a really good drummer. He ended up being mm-hmm. in Date at the Fair years later, but he was in, it was before or right when he started in Right Trinity, the ska band. And okay. he went in there with Barker one time and he was like, I just need something punk rock because he was a huge metal head. He was listening to the, <laughs> like everything. Fix me. Fucking Fix metal. Me. Yeah, he was just like, I need something to get in. And you had found Donuts and Glory and you gave him the CD. You're like, hey, man, I think, you know, you should listen to this. So Steve comes back home and he had this Fairmont, this white Fairmont that he souped up with this huge subwoofer in the back. And it I mean, very he, metal, very metal. Yeah. I mean, he would drive down the street and you would just be like, dun, 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 dun. you'd be like, oh, here comes Steve from a mile away. Nice. A- and out of everything, he had like Fear Factory and Pantera, but he had this CD that he put in. And it was like, for me, I was like, holy shit, this is really good. And I remember talking to you one time and I said, yeah, man. Um, you know, isn't Donuts and Glory like one of your favorite bands or something? You know, because you gave it to Steve, you're like, no, I fucking hated that band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but here, let me let me talk about that. Like, what I liked, like, it was about what what were you into? Right. Like, you know, and again, I I'm not one to say one band's better than the other. I like I what I like, but I, God, yeah, it's coming back. I remember you kind of you would start to size up people. Like, if you're into these bands, and hey, you're definitely gonna want to check out this. So. And that's how all the descriptions, I always tried to write those freaking labels. I got like carpal tunnel from doing that all those years. But just like, hey, if you like this and this, this is what you should be into. That's how because, we would find all the fucking bands because of those descriptions you wrote. Yeah. Well, but, but dude, I used to like, I used to get Maximum Rock and Roll, Punk Planet. I used to scour those reviews. And then if I saw something I liked, I'd, I'd throw four bucks in an envelope and mail it off into the freaking abyss and hope to get a record back. And I always, it always pissed me off when people just like would, would shit on a band. Because yeah. it's like, hey, well, I don't know what you're into. You know, with Maximum Rock and Roll, you start to learn the reviewers. And uh, Ray Lujan, I think, was one of the guys I used to follow a lot. Because, yeah, maybe I like Krusty Punk, so I'm going to say Sicko Sucks. But yeah. It's just, you know, it was really tough to navigate that. And it was something that when people would come into the store, it was a matter of like, well, okay, what are you into? You tell me first what bands you like. Oh, you like that fast beat. You like that lag wagon drum beat. Well, here, you're going to friggin' everything on in this corner from epitaph is right up your alley so knock yourself out donuts and glory whatever it was yeah so you were kind of like our walking thank you list in a sense like our our google of the of the, of the time <laughs> our music google sure. <laughs> in pumps and lakes or uh, was yeah, it pumped in, in our, lakes or pumped and plains pumped and lakes right yeah whatever sure let's go with that <laughs> Wait, but yeah, in our small we're... microcosm of the world no where the fuck where was where was the record store it was pumped and lakes right yeah Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I was like, I, I was like, my remember. God, you don't even know where the store is. <laughs> uh, jeez, I, I'm trying to think if I even remember the address. I don't. No, I haven't been there in ages. Yeah, it was right next to. I think one of the. Oh, I think that might be how we found it because we were look. We always shopped at. Um, what was it? There was a Salvation Army, and we always you, either we went yeah. to Dover, but there was one across the street from the record store, and I think that might be how we found it. Absolutely. That's where my wardrobe was from for that, that whole time. Oh, hell yeah. Like $3 cool. shirts that were nice and worn so they were soft. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris, actually, I think you were the reason he found Mineral and Jimmy Eat World's uh, Static Prevails. Do you remember? You obviously remember those records. Uh, yeah, I remember those records. I don't remember this mo- those moments. Like, you know, I remember hanging out, like people coming in and just having good times and, and kicking back and and chatting. I don't remember the actual transactions of what people actually bought. I do remember this asshole coming to me eons later, this dude, uh, I'm just gonna say his first name, this dude, Todd coming and say, Oh yeah, we used to love coming in there. We used to steal shit from that store all the time. And I was like, mom, fuck you. That's like the douchiest thing. This is a tiny independent record store that makes zero money. Yeah. Like when the, you know, like how can you do that and think you're like a punk rocker or whatever you think you are? You're just a total asshole. Wow. That's fucked up. Yeah. And again, like our, our prices, we, there was no margins made on any of that stuff. And you know, we always, when we bought CDs, we paid a lot for them and we, we, we didn't mark them up too much, but whatever. Yeah. So cool stuff is cool. How did you people like that dickhead? So when you came in though, what was her name? Tracy was the one who brought you in, right? And then Jill was working. Were the two of them? Because it was a very there uh, there was a huge you know quote unquote punk um, catalog there. And was that there when so when you walked in and you know were transitioning and you took over, 
you know, her her position. And then Dave, he was the other, he was the owner, right? Dan. 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 That's right, Dan. And I, I mean, Dan, I think he he was like a big hippie dude, right? Wasn't he? Like. Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm sure he was a punk rocker hippie. He played, you know, he had years on all of us, so he uh, he played bands his whole life, and yeah, I guess he just wanted to open a record store. Or I'm not really sure how he got into it. I think someone was selling it, and he he just the opportunity was there. But did you find and, that he had brought in initially that style of music, or he was just open to you guys with new yeah, ideas? He was he was really cool about just letting us you know, take care of the ordering for stuff. You know, we, we, we seem, we were the ones out there greeting everybody coming in and just talking about the music, playing the music. So he, he was really, really free and letting us do whatever we wanted. I think Tracy was definitely the one responsible. I think she had a predecessor as well, who I don't, I don't, I've never met. And maybe that's how things got started, but she was like, you talk about a music encyclopedia. Like she not only knew about all the bands, she knew all the bands and, you know, she she just she had all the information like just right off the top of her head. Same same kind of passion, and it was contagious. Yeah. So. Yeah, is that how? So then now, True Zero around this time is. Did you start <laughs> that because you were working there and you were like, I just need to start a band, or did that happen prior to you working there? No, yeah, like um, I guess I, I'd never really thought of playing in a band. I had no musical abilities or anything in high school or maybe it was right after high school. I don't remember I sang in some band and it was awful. I think they were, they were like a metal band. Maybe I'm not even sure. Okay. And there was a definite, unlike Lane Meyer, there was a definite you're out. <laughs> like it was in the studio. <laughs> we're yeah. still not sure if you're kicked out. You just like, yeah. didn't show up and we didn't tell you to not to show, to show. Up. Yeah. I've been waiting, you know, I was waiting, but I'm um, <laughs> waiting for the, our next show. But yeah, that was a definite, like I remember being in the studio with this band and then being like, Hey, can you like, I didn't do anything. Like I didn't write lyrics, music. I just came, showed up, and tried to sing. It was so bad. I'm like, can you put more of like a growl in your voice? And I'm like, yeah, all right, we're done. <laughs> and they're like, so. But uh, you're talking about starting a band. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Chris, the bass player from True Zero, used to come, in, and Matt, they both used to come into Flipside all the time. And okay. I'm not even sure how those dots got connected because Chris obviously played bass, Matt played drums, I played nothing. But I know at one point we just said, hey, let's let's do this. And we walked over. There was a small little music store in Pompton Lakes. And I think Chris and I walked over and I bought a guitar. And I'm like, all right, let's do this. No kidding. Yeah. No, that was it. I mean, again, I think the the songs probably reflect that kind of that way the band got started. But, yeah, that was it. And we uh, we had a lot of fun playing. You know, it was good times. I always thought that people people came to see us more for the the comedy routines than the actual music, but I didn't care. People were there. We were having a blast. Yeah. I mean, um, I didn't, I never got to see you guys play. I had always heard cause, uh, Andy, he would play this thing. You guys had a split seven inch with Jill or. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cause they were, or, or the tape or something like that. They would always play that and then play, you know, true zero stuff. And, and I was like, wow, this is like really good. It's like really catchy. And all my friends, like they loved you guys and they loved Jill and that whole. Oh, that that's theme. awesome. Oh, yeah. They were huge that fans. Warms my heart. I can't believe you didn't know that. They would always like talk about that. And they were like, oh, they like they just put you guys on such like a pedestal. Like, oh, my God, like that's fucking true. Yeah, zero. See, that's crazy. I always I really thought I'm like every time we'd play, I'm like, man, we got a lot of friends and it's awesome. They come out and, uh, you know, let's we just we never knew what was going to happen. Like, I always used to joke around, like we would plan to say all these things on stage and then we'd end up <laughs> saying things that we never thought we would say. And <laughs> yeah. So I thought it was just more fun and people were there for the comedic value, but that's cool that I'm, I'm glad people found the songs catchy. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, when you go, would, yeah, because like, no, go on. I was going to say they were, I mean, we had a ton of fun playing. So how yeah. long, how long were you guys a band? Hmm. <sighs> Sure. I, you know, whatever we had, you know, like, like all good things, we burned out quickly, right? Now we, uh, we probably, we put in a couple of years, we recorded the split seven inch, we recorded a bunch of various comp tracks. And then, um, I think at that time, you know, everyone started to grow up like musically a little bit and, and start diversifying the things that we're into. I know Chris was my favorite citizen right after. Yeah. He was getting into more things like the, the more emo wave yeah. and melodic stuff that was coming out. I was probably the least mature on the musical side based on zero music ability. <laughs> so those guys went and started doing their own thing. And, you know, I kind of played with various people here and there and the, you know, after that. So when, um, Oh my God, I have so many questions about this. Where did, um, Sergio, was he in, 
uh, True Zero? Was he in My Favorite Citizen? He was in both. He okay. started in a uh, in True Zero, and then um, when we folded, like those guys kept playing together. So how did you guys like when how? Because didn't you record at Harry's? Is that how uh, you... Tooth, Toothless Harry's? Toothless Harry's, yeah. No, True Zero never did. True Zero recorded. Um, we went to a bunch of places. I think our first recording was we're sp- we're going to be on the Descendants compilation. What? That, yeah, the Homage that Coolidge Records released. Oh wow, Coolidge Records. Yeah, the, Holy shit. yeah, the dis- um, that. God, I I have this all written down somewhere, which is a good thing. But we went to some some dude's barn. He had a studio set up. And that recording was atrocious. Really? That was like, yeah, oh, it's it's terrible. Um, it's I have all of this stuff, and I can share it with you if you want a really good laugh. But that was really bad. Like, <laughs> I couldn't play guitar. I had to play a guitar solo in the song, and I just couldn't hack it. Like to the <laughs> point where Matt was like, "Hey, you want me to do it?" I'm like, "No, I got I got to do it." <laughs> and I think they ended up using like creative fading of the the tracks to try to get it to work. But yeah, and then um. We recorded with um, two guys, Arik Victor from uh, Creep Records. Yep. We, we recorded with him. Hopefully, oh, wow. I got that name right. It's been a long time. And yeah, that was so. That was much more fun. Like we were much more at ease at that time, and um, he helped us get a really, really great sound. And we also recorded with uh, Alap Maman, and uh, he was, I think, just getting started out recording stuff in his house at that time. But again, those, those were the tracks that came out on the split seven inch. And, yeah. And yeah. I, you guys are on the NJPP archives. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. 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 I, I, I said, Joe, the, the tracks, I sent them everything. So including the shitty songs. I think he just chose not to post those. <laughs> Sometimes I think he couldn't transfer them over too well. There's one, there's one okay. band he has up that it just, it's, it's like you can hear the, the, t- the cassette just still eating itself. In, in <laughs> awesome. You're like, Oh God. But yeah, you guys have, um, you got the uh, the split up there, the seven inch up there. You got "Can't Believe You Kissed Her." I remember that song, and I love mm-hmm. it when a plan comes together. So we, when we started, we were Congress of Cow, and I think when we started going to Flipside, we were in Congress of Cow. It was me, Chris, Dimaselli, and then Andy, mm-hmm. and um, they would play that song. And we, when Andy, when I kicked Andy out, as I just think of kicking people out, you're freaking notorious. I am you? like, I am on a mission. Get out of yeah. my way. But when <laughs> nice. Andy was out, remember we. We practice um, uh, Love When a Planet Comes Together, and we played it on Chris's deck. It was a show. I, I was there. I remember. Yeah. I remember. We were like, they were like, this song goes to the Allen. And I didn't realize that I think when we were practicing it, because I was playing bass and I was, and I sang it. And that was the first time I think I ever sang like a Congress song. And actually, I think that was the first time I started singing in a band. And uh, we're, I thought that Chris was the singer the whole time. And then Barker mentioned me. He's like, oh, no, that's Alan singing. I'm like, wait, what? So I was so confused for so long. I was like, holy shit. Then we're, we're playing in front of you. I was like, oh, my God, you, you, I'm going to sing this in front of you. I hope we don't fuck this up. And it was probably no, awful, I, but it was fun. Let's go. Well, actually, we both sang. And Chris, that was Chris's song. He sang that one. The, oh, I love okay. Playing oh, yeah, was, so you guys are. I was no, right. You're, you're totally right. God yeah. damn it. But you guys had yeah. really catchy songs, though. You guys had it. I, th- I found that. I thought that you guys had it like that whole. You had it figured out in a very. <laughs> I, you know, it's like you might not have thought, but it was yeah. super catchy shit. Oh, totally. It's D and then G and then A and then Think of the Descendants repeat. songs, man. That's all they are. It's like three chords or four chords. That's all this stuff was. It was nothing crazy. But the, if the melody was there and it was it was poppy and catchy, that's that's all that matters, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate that. And it was fun. It was such a good time. And, like, Matt would sing, too. He would just, like, scream from behind the drums. And, I mean, those guys really had – I mean, I don't think – I don't recall sitting down and being like, hey, I got this song. It was more like – you just we would get together and just start playing and everyone kind of filled in the blanks and it it worked it was fun i mean we had this one song called uh ck1 yep which was uh um, s-c-e-k k-a-y-1 yeah i used to love that one and it was it was really like i don't even think i think i just played g the whole song but like chris <laughs> and matt found ways to kind of just you know make a, a melody out of it and just sing about um you know all those calvin klein ads and and all the girls in their underwear so yeah, but it was like political unrest. I mean, political unrest <laughs> and mistreatment, and you know that's that's what it was all about. It was like basically child porn back in the day. That's, you know, <laughs> that's what it was. Moving on, moving on. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So around this time, so you, now what is the timeline here though between True Zero and Flipside? Like when which was first? It was True Zero and then yeah, Flipside, or it was Flipside first. Yeah, okay. I've been working there for a lot of bit for for a lot of bit 
for a, a lot bit. of a lot of bits for a lot of bits and uh you know i just got to know people all the the regulars coming in and again i don't remember actually no you fuck it you said that in the freaking interview earlier you said they came yeah, that's the right store. when, right, when so. it comes out you can just go back and listen to it okay but <laughs> but yeah I'm, i and i there was just kind of like a real simple conversation with chris one day like talking about bands and i think it was just as stupid like hey we should start a band and we're like yeah or, may, or maybe it was Matt's fault. I think Matt was like just coming out of a band and wanted to start a new project. So, but it, yeah, it just like it happened like that, and, and then we just set up a little practice room at my parents' house in the basement. And yeah, I don't know. I really don't know how we wrote any of these songs. I mean, they were all based on like total true life experiences. So it was it just it seemed to come together. Well, but um, you're yeah. like you're. I'm yep. I'm so psyched on it now. Hearing the things you said and the feedback you got because no one ever really told us that well i think a lot of people were bummed when you guys broke up i mean i mean i, I, I know, was bummed i, I know out of my <laughs> well i know out of our friends i mean i think a lot of our friends you know you were the guy that taught us about a lot of music that we didn't know and you opened that door so i think i don't want to say idolize because that's a strong word but we definitely put you up on a pedestal we're like dude it's fucking alan from Flipside. like he taught us all this stuff and his band was really good we're like wow this guy's He's so much cooler. <laughs> yeah, see, that's we why we had that step up at Flipside. We had that landing. Yeah, you, it, mission you, accomplished. Just to like, declare your dominance as we walk. Exactly. In. Like, it, hello, it everyone. Obviously worked. No, that's that's really cool. And like, remember, I've got a couple of years on you guys too. Yeah, you're um, you are five. Years we, we don't need to talk about it, but you're like fifty it, years. Old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, because you no. and Sean. I mean, they're like you know, j- jump in for a second to lay my stuff. You and Sean were those the same age because you guys were, I think. 23 and me and chris were like 18 is that really yeah and you guys used to always talk about how fucking old you were and i think it's hilarious yeah can i want to go back and slap both of us oh my god (laughs) you stupid little kids well sean the other day when i was up in the other yeah a couple weeks ago when i was in jersey you know Mm -hmm. he was talking about you like you know i'm 39 now and he's 44 43 44 and he was talking about his you know he's like yeah i'm gonna be sore and i'm like now that makes sense but when he was 24 he would always bitch about man i'm so sore and i told him about these like i know i don't know what the fuck i was talking about i'm seriously years like old. you're freaking invincible at that age oh, i yeah. don't know what we were talking about i know it's like you guys were like yeah we you know we gotta you know have these real jobs and we gotta you know we're, we're 24 we gotta grow up and i was like jesus christ i'm 39 i'm still out there <laughs> yeah i don't know i'm I'm in a room surrounded by Lego, so I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, dude, I love your uh, Instagram Lego pictures, by the way. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. It's like, yeah, it's super cool. What, thanks. It would started as a way just to keep, like, you know, uh, doing photography uh, during the – when it was cold outside, just kind of enveloped all of my photography nowadays. And I don't know. It just – it's something fun to do. Yeah, didn't you get like a you know I don't like to talk about this too much because people are always like talk about punk rock or whatever. Right. But that's um. But you yeah, didn't you? You got like a lot of likes on. I was looking at some of the photos. I remember it was like I think I I found it like a year ago or something, and uh, there was a lot of people following like your oh, stuff. I got you, likes. you have sixty six hundred and seventy nine followers on your account. I got likes. Alan yeah. Rappa, if anyone wants A L A N R A P P A, you should go follow because he just poses these Legos in this like super cool photos but then he takes pictures of them and it's it's fucking badass yeah i play with them too don't get me wrong it's just you know i don't, I don't take pictures of video of that <laughs> <laughs> no, no thanks man yeah, yeah like yeah it's it's weird it, it just became an addiction and uh it's no, fun I, but i like that you still i think a lot of people when i've talked to them now they're like yeah you know i got this boring job and it's kind of routine but i like that people still hold on oh. it's something fun even if it's something very simple it's just, it's just yeah 100 billion percent agree with you like there's there's days where i'm just you're you're cranking through your crappy job or whatever you're sinking in all these hours at least i was and then i i'm done with that i just yeah. sit on the couch and i'm like god like i i i, I created nothing i like mm. i brought nothing really new into this world i didn't i didn't derive any kind of joy out of dealing with whatever I dealt with at work. And that's why it's little things like that. Um, one of the cool things that I, I love doing now is um, I've been trying to learn GarageBand on my phone. And I bought this thing that I just hook my guitar up right to my phone. And what? it blows my mind. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's called the iRig HD2. So I'm just, you know, I'm grabbing crappy drum tracks and I'm just recording some bass and guitar and vocals. And just like, how am I doing this on my phone? This Holy is insane. Crap. I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, and it's 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 in it's super super cool. And I like I send uh, my buddies that I play with in uh, Suntan Lake. I send them like, hey, here's some new tracks, like some new stuff I'm working on, and 
That's awesome, dude. Yeah, I saw that you were doing, uh, you're playing in a band again, or just like just getting together and jamming with some friends. Yeah, I mean, we're we're trying to figure it out, but it, you know, life does get in the way of a lot of this, so that's yeah. why I was looking for how do we just make recordings? Like, I've got like just all these songs from you know the past twenty years that I want to document before my 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 muscles atrophy and I can't play them anymore. <laughs> and tell my kids like, yeah, when are you? I used to write all these songs, so it, it's just been. It's been a lot of fun. Again, why I'm trying to encourage uh, my kids, like, hey, look, I just recorded this on my phone. You want to go make some crazy songs? Let's go do it. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I, 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 I the one thing I kind of got from the other day, and we jump back into more questions of like oh, back in the day, but I, uh, I just started putting too much of expectations on things, and I'm starting to you know, like strip them away because I'd be like, well, I can't really write songs. I have no place to record, and I really got to put them out this way and and this and. I'm like, why am I putting so many rules on this stuff? It's like, just get a guitar. Like, you know, I need to go buy another guitar because I sold mine a couple of years ago and mm -hmm. just start recording stuff just for the hell. Of it. And you could put it out everywhere just for free and just. Yeah, absolutely. You know? There is zero barriers nowadays. Yeah. Like you just everyone's got this power to do it and, and there should be nothing stopping you. So go yeah. forth, man. Conquer. I know. Thank you. See, and I, hey. <laughs> it would go fun. <laughs> no, I was going to say, like, and the cool thing about it, too, is you remember, um, like, Bill who, uh, with the six-string bass? Bill with the six-string bass. Like, I, in one of the, the bands I played with after, like, all this other stuff. For, um, but I used to play with him, and he's now in Virginia. I think it's Virginia, anyway. But I just sent him some tracks. I'm like, hey, Bill, can you record a bass line on this? So, like, the opportunity to collaborate, like, with anyone, anywhere, is, is open. Yeah, you know, there's pr free programs like Audacity. You can just share a project, just use Dropbox. So it's so super cool. So yeah, do it, man. I actually, get some, yeah. Get well, some new tunes. We definitely, after the show, me and Chris, uh, we were talking with like the humble guys about how excited we were. And we're like, we should all maybe think about putting some stuff out there maybe. So I don't know. We'll see. Absolutely. See yeah, I goes. saw your little your little tease on Instagram about like a new song. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no. I was like, we have a new song. I was like, no, we don't. People were messaging me like that was fucked up. I'm like, yeah, yep. that's what, that's what happens. Well, you can still have the rights to why'd you say that? My my <laughs> sole contribution to Lane Meyer. Um, that's right. That's that actually that um before okay, before I get into that, because I wanna I wanna talk about your backyard shows. Mm -hmm. Because you there was like this whole thing going, you know, you had you know, True Zero going on, you flip side, you're working there. And then um, I remember one time you showed us a bunch of pictures where Less Than Jake before, I mean, right around the time, like like Pezcor was out and that was, I, I think it was big for what those standards were back then. Mm -hmm. And it was right before Losing Streak, but they used to play or they had, they did play in your backyard as a full band. And like, uh, it was like a pool party where they played and I think Discount and My Pal Trigger, I don't know if it was the same show, but you used to. Was it a bunch of shows you did, or was it like one? And I'm blown this out, like you had all these shows. No, no, we 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 used to have like a handful of shows. We used to throw these these luau's every now and then. Yeah, I, th I don't right. think I, less than Jake one. I don't think it was during the summer. I think it was. Um, now they're the it was pool. a little cooler when they played, so it wasn't a true luau. But yeah, okay. they 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 did play. I I think it was a free show too. If I'm mistaken on that, I'm a jerk and I apologize. But I thought we it was like a secret free thing, and just uh, maybe like a hundred or so people showed up. Wow. Was it, how did you contact these bands? Like, how did you become friends with them? Uh, you know, I just, I would make connections working at the record store because you deal with a lot of the labels directly, mm. a lot of the smaller labels or bands selling their stuff directly. You deal with them and they'd be like, hey, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming through town. Can you hook up a show anywhere? And I'd be like, all right, let me see. I'd try to ask around, like, who puts on shows? Um, I mean, it was, again, it was really tough because there's, there's no email. There's, there's not yeah. a lot of these ways where you can contact out 4 million people all at once. And there was a, a dude that I, I met, a really, really cool guy, um, Anthony Trance, who kind of had, you know, connections with, not kind of, he had connections with all the, the clubs, like the Pipeline, um, Coney Island High, and, you know, would just work with him to, to start putting these shows on. We had the Skaters World thing going for a while, which was a ton of fun. Oh, yeah, that's right. You were the one who was putting those shows on. Yeah. And that, that was like, that was still crazy. I mean, I, it's that, that whole roller rink is gone these days, but is it like, like a Costco now or something? It's something ridiculous, but yeah. yeah, just to think like, okay, yeah. Like get up kids, Jimmy Eat world. Yeah. They all played here. Like nobody even knows, you know, if you put your head to the ground in the parking lot, you can kind of still hear the guitars speeding back, but that's about <laughs> it. So. Have you seen the video online, the Jimmy Eat world and the get a kid show from there? Awesome. I was so psyched about that. I, so it's like crazy. so amazing when this footage comes out. Um, oh, I yeah. check all the time. There's one show like total deviation here, but there's one show yeah. that I'm still trying to find video of. 
And it was the Surprise Descendants show at City Gardens from Trenton, New Jersey, oh, wow. where um, Chad, uh, the singer at the time, was sick. So Milo flew in just to play that show. Uh, I found a couple pictures from it, but I, man, I someone had to have videotaped that. It was probably one of the best shows I've ever been to. I was right up front, dead oh, center, and I would just I would love to, to relive that again. Were there anyway, like, Yeah, were there local bands that? Because I always thought that when you would listen to music, you're like, that's cool. But when you were listening to a band like The Descendants, like you would go like ape shit for it. Yeah. So you're asking, were there local bands? That, were there local uh, bands that you were into that back then, or were you, was it mostly bands that were on that were on tour that outside of Jersey that you were into? Yeah, you know, I think I was probably I neglected the local scene more than I should have, mm. just because I was always looking like you know, you know, you always look off into the horizon instead of like what's in front of your face to appreciate what you've had. So I think that's probably a mistake I made. There were a lot of bands. Um, God, there's this one band. I wish I could remember the name. There was, um, uh, it was a female, uh, gr- singer, guitar player. I think her name was Carla. And, uh, yeah, I, like, I love their stuff. It, was it pillow? I, if, I feel like they had a song about a ninja. I, you know, it's been so so long, but I, I there was that was the one local band that I really wanted to put something out on Pop Kid, and I just it never you know materialized. But man, I was at like so many of those local shows. Is Weston considered a, a local band? No, that's that's uh, Allentown. <laughs> okay, never mind. Then. Yeah, but, I mean, they, I think I think we kind of embraced them, like them and Digger and who else? Mm-hmm. Like from Allentown, where we kind of were like, yeah, like you're part plow? of the scene. Plow, plow. Yeah, man. I mean, everyone, I think, plowed a huge following from Jersey. Yeah, but. see, I think True Zero spent a lot of time there playing with those guys just because Matt went to school in the area, so he knew Creep Records and knew yeah. the rest of those bands. So, Do you remember the time that we, we covered the, the Plow United song, Spindle? <laughs> and uh, what's his face from, what was that band? Uh, Throttle Jockey. They get this singer, Tom Martin. Tom Martin. He was like, we're, we're, we're just playing something. We didn't play it. And he's in the back. He's like, play Spindle. Yeah. I think to, to this day, Tom's still in the back of some club somewhere yelling that. <laughs> was he the one who lit the, the, the one dude in the band? They like lit him on fire because he had this flash paper and he was doing a magic trick and it like caught the guy's hair or something. I, I have no recollection of that, but that sounds, if it's going to be somebody, it would have been Tom Martin. <laughs> that guy was amazing. It was so out there. Yeah, I think he's got like a dozen kids these days. And... Oh, Jesus. oh, Pennsylvania. Sorry yep. for from Pennsylvania, but it's fucking true. Um, okay, so um, what was I going to yeah, say? Yeah, so we've established Flipside came first, then True Zero. Okay, so Flipside, True <laughs> Zero. What, how did you leave? Uh, when did you leave Flipside and why? Um, I'm sure it wasn't money related. Uh, you know, well, <laughs> I, it, it might have been. I, I don't, you know, there was a lot going on there. I think Dan had, um, he had lost his his passion for it. And it's, I went through the same thing probably soon after where you kind of, you just get burned out yeah. after a while. And I think he was dealing with the whole, the financial aspect of the store, which I had no, no idea about. Like I showed up, I sold a bunch of records. I, I got paid and I went home, yeah. but he had to pay rent, you know, utilities, taxes, all that other stuff. And I think it was just, I don't know if we were making money as a store, if we were doing well, Um, and so he was looking for ways to kind of like, how can I make more money? And I know for the major label releases, which a lot of these, these punk rock bands now started signing the majors. So we needed to stock more of that. And it just, there wasn't any profit in that. So I know he started looking at like different ways to kind of get, um, inventory in and like CDs and records. And I didn't agree with it. I didn't like, I didn't sit well with me and it Mm -hmm. just came time. Like, you know, I, I, I think it's best for me to just leave. You know, way back when I thought like, oh, one day I'm maybe I'll buy this from him and, and take it over. But I was going to ask, I... ask that. Like, were you? So it sounds like you were thinking about one day buying yeah, it or opening yeah. a record store. There was a place in Pompton Lakes. This place called Slater's Mill. Uh, I, I, it was like a bar restaurant thing, I, I guess. And it went up for sale. And Dan and I went over there to check it out. Man, that place would have been awesome. Like, and that, that was the goal. We thought, hey, we could buy this, turn it into a record store venue because it had two stages. It had upstairs and downstairs. It would have been so much fun. And um, I called the real estate agent and she never called me back, rightfully so, because I was probably some like 18 year old kid or whatever. Call and be like, hey, I saw this building. Yeah, it's cool. I want to open a punk rock store there and have bands come play. And can you call my dad? Bye. You know, <laughs> like I probably left the most ridiculous message. I have so they no never credit. called us. Exactly. I have no credit. I get paid in cash. You know, like I have no idea what anything's going on. But um, 
yeah, so she never called back and nothing ever transpired from that. But I, I, I pass that place every now and then. And I still think like, man, that would have been so cool. I'm sure it's been a while. So it's probably torn down now. But I, I hang on to that vision of how cool that would have been just to open this kind of this this spot where in northern New Jersey for bands to play. We'd have a big record store that would probably be out of business now. But whatever. Hang yeah. on to the dream. I mean, you had a lot of connections. I mean, I remember you were friends with Jimmy Eat World before they became like Jimmy Eat World. I don't know if you still talk to those guys or not. No, no, no. It's It's been a long time since I've, I've seen them or talked to them. And yeah, it's it's crazy. Like thinking of these memories because again everybody just hey come back crash in my house and you know you wake up the next day and there's your your mom having coffee like <laughs> with jimmy Eat world or the mr t experience or you know it's just so <laughs> bizarre that's so but wild it was, yeah it was, it was really it was cool um and again all those hookups came just because you know you, you you do a show for one band in new jersey and then they pass your name around and then like you know it just spreads from there so. Especially if it was a good show. I mean, that was the thing. It, you know, for bands to be on the road, it was it was a gamble because you show up four states away from home, and you're like, well, we hope that this person could put on a good show. And if if you did once, you became reliable, so everyone would pass your number and like call. Yeah, them, call absolutely. Them, call them. I mean, you guys probably know that more than anything with all the tours that Lane Meyer's done, right? Yeah. Like, you oh, yeah. never know when you you go from one state to another, and you know, like I um, True Zero did like a, a partial tour as well, and it was the same deal. Like you're. You're you're sleeping on a couch if you're lucky, on the yep. floor if you're not, and you know ten people showing up that hate you. So, <laughs> but I get it, and you know we tried. Like uh, we always wanted to make sure that the bands got paid if we could pay them, you know, and, and uh, we gave them a place to crash at least, and and then uh, took them to New York a lot of times to the uh, Empire State Building, do a little sightseeing. Yeah, I'm sure they appreciate that. And when sure. you. You know, actually, you said something I, I kind of caught my attention. So when, when major labels back then were putting records in the stores, you couldn't make any money off of them? It's it, Our distribution at Flipside was tough. We dealt with a lot of independent distributors. So like okay. guys that carried the punk rock stuff, like Lookout Records, Fat Records, that kind of thing. Yeah, if, when major labels, like Warner Brother releases, Sony releases, they were all handled through major label distributors. Yeah. You know, th there may have been more. Maybe I wasn't privy to the, the business back then, but that's kind of like the the short of it. So yeah. And, and you couldn't just go and like, yeah, give me two Jimmy world CDs mm. from like these other distributors, you know, they were expecting big orders. So it, yeah, it wasn't something that we could really keep up with. And we discouraged people when they were coming into it, like, Oh, do you have this, you know, do you have Beyonce's new record? Like, yeah, you're in the wrong place. You know, yeah. not, not, not like, Hey, I'm, I'm better than you or holier than now. It's just like, yeah, we don't, we don't stock that stuff. And the major label stuff, we, we also couldn't get things on release date. So, mm. you know, people want that, that Jimmy at world record that day. Right. They're, they're not going to wait for it. Did so. you ever see high fidelity? I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I keep thinking of that as I'm talking and yeah. I'm picturing John Cusack saying the words. That are what do you think is the mall? Like, what do you yeah. think is, go to the mall? <laughs> <laughs> so it's totally, I was never like that though. I, you know, like I'm, I might've been bad at one point, but I've learned to like, you know, music speaks to people. So just like whatever they like, like you, you can't shit on it yeah you know whether it's 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 top 40 radio or whatever just if, like let them like what they like man let it just... it's such a that's such a good point i mean the fact that anyone can tell someone else what they like or that they're wrong is such a bullshit move and granted that when we were doing this like when i don't personally when i was like that i mean i was you know uh in my teenage years or like maybe my early 20s i started letting go of that and i was like mm -hmm. because you I mean, as you get older you just start really giving a shit about stuff because you're more yeah. become kind of a little bit more self not self-absorbed but you you kind of see the world a little bit more and mm -hmm. i think it's a good point and just that if someone likes a song even if it's this even if it's that fucking gangnam time song or that shit is, <laughs> you know it's yeah. if that's like someone's jam and it makes them move then you're like you should kind of uh, like embrace that and be like man if that gets you moving and it makes you happy then don't shit on it don't totally that. totally i mean they're all fucking wrong we know that right oh, exactly <laughs> yeah but <he's, laughs> i mean they're idiots but... <laughs> no just kidding like um <laughs> yeah and also another thing to that too is as i got i got older like i i went through a total music burnout period where i, I don't know what happened i left flip side um you guys kicked me out of Lane Meyer. Like, uh, like I just, <laughs> I was done did. with music for a bit. You kicked me out of Lane Meyer. Sorry. Let me be more specific. I think, I think I called you. I think I called you and, and, and did it and, and kicked you out. Uh, I'll take your word for it. Cause I don't remember that. I, can't remember. I just remember Chris kind of telling me like, I think you were supposed to. Yeah. Cause I remember talking to Chris and he's like, Oh wait, you didn't talk to Mike. 
And I'm like, no, <laughs> oh. you, you got kicked out. <laughs> I'm like, what? No, because you yeah. did, you did, and I know you were going in a different direction with us, but I do remember you had a party at your house like a couple weeks after or a weekend after, and we all still showed up, and I don't think Sean came. And um, it was like me and all the Jefferson guys and we're there. And I remember it was like a, it was in your living room. We're all sitting around watching TV or something. And it's like a raging the, party, raging I, party. Well, it was like the Seinfeld party that you had. It was the Seinfeld oh, okay. last episode. And you brought a you had a bunch of people over. This is before you drank because you didn't drink back then. You drank no, like no, I remember no. after the fact. And then you started no, throwing I, parties when you were drinking. Well, you, you ruined my life and kicked me out of the band. I had to find <laughs> solace, you know, and I found it in a bottle. What can I say? Yeah, because you went from not drinking to like. Not like drink all the time, but when you we showed a party, we we're like, "Wow, Alan's like fucking throwing these back right now." Yeah, and I think yeah, I uh, sorry, yeah, I, don't, I don't, I don't. Okay, so I remember coming in and we're in this this group of people in the living room, and I think we're all ready to watch Seinfeld, and you're like, you called me out, and there's like 10, 15 people there or something. You're like, "So, Mike, like, what happened? What happened <laughs> with the band?" And I'm like, "Uh." <laughs> Like, I um, that, that's the I liquor know, talking man no i don't think you were sober i don't think you were drinking i think you were like so yeah like what like what happened there like how, like why'd you guys decide this and i was like uh i don't know <laughs> this is awkward <laughs> but it was that's well awesome. played <laughs> uh you know we could all kiss and make up though it's cool i remember i think sean and i hated each other for a while and yeah, i can't guys, for the life of me remember why i think you I don't need to remember. I don't need to relive it. I Listen, just, it's all I'm going to cool tell now. you why you hate it. No, I think it was just a, uh, I think it was just a difference in personalities and you know, I, I think Sean. Really uh, oh yes, I'm cool. He's a prick. Tour. Now I remember. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for putting that straight. <laughs> I put, I like watered it down. No, I mean, I yeah. think now if you guys saw each other, you'd be fine. But back then, uh, I mean, totally. you know, just think about like, think of the pressure of shit. Think of the, the four of us, right? So, you, you know, me and Chris broke up, with Congress of Cow, and then we got Sean, and then we got you to play guitar. So the four of us got together and started practicing a backstage, which was amazing. I miss that place so much. It was such a great shitty place to practice. Yes, at. yes. It was. Like, I, you could uh, smoke in the, the rooms, time. and you could smoke in the rooms that were carpeted. Like I don't know, smoke in the rooms, piss in the corner, like no one cared. Just pay your twenty bucks for the hour, and like you could do whatever you wanted in there. Didn't you have your bachelor party in the giant in room E, the one in the back? Uh, I did. My buddy Tim uh, surprised me. Totally hooked that up where they, you know, because again, the the what did they call it? Like the performance room or something? Yeah, yeah right? the stage. It was a stage in the back room. Totally. You could put on a show. I know that's exactly what he did. He flew uh, the guys from Chester Copperpot out from oh, uh, wow. Sweden, who are again one of my favorite bands. We yeah. released their stuff on Popkin. It was just like so awesome. They just they played a show and. We just we partied and had an amazing time. That's such a, it's such a brilliant. I remember when I heard that you did that because that wasn't. We were. How old are you? You got married. Sure. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I think uh, I've been married like twelve years, thirteen years. 12, I, I don't know. I like in that range. Fucking... Uh, yeah, it must have been like on a Facebook post or something that you you posted pictures or something like that. I was like, oh my god, that's genius. Yeah, it was it was super cool. Um, amazing. And then they played uh, acoustic on William Patterson, WPSC. So mm -hmm. it was it was a good time. That was the only time I've ever got to see like those guys play. And um, They're super cool guys to hang out with. And we still have an unreleased like EP from them that maybe one day, one day, <laughs> you'll see the light of day. Can you just throw it on Spotify? And like, that's yeah. it. Yeah. I think we should do that. Tim, um, who I run Pop Kid with now, or he more runs with it. I do very little. You know, he's he's still a collector and still wants that release, wants the vinyl. Like, I don't think it's real to him if it's just digital only. So, OK, yeah, I yeah. can see that. I could definitely say that. keep those out. Like, um, cool. we are coming up in an hour. I don't know if you have to jump back into work or anything or I don't want to. Uh, I can keep no, talking. This is, this, I still haven't gotten my, my nugget. I, it's, it's, it's all starting to come back, though. OK, it's good. Times that the anger and hostility I felt towards <laughs> you. No, no. Were I you mad at me, though? Were you mad at me then? Like back then? No, no, no. Because I think, again, that was I was on the decline for music. Like, I, I think that's kind of the reason the rift between us where I didn't want to play shows anymore. Like, I just wanted to, to work on recording. I wanted to hang out with my girlfriend. Like, yeah, I was just I was just done. Well, I think yeah, um, I think that was one thing, too, that you had just bought this like you think you'd just finance like this Jeep Cherokee, like brand new. 
you got this brand new job making good money. You were dating yeah. this girl, Jen, I believe her name was. That is correct. And you, that was like, you were like, I kind of want to stay around here. And we were like, we want to leave. And that was yeah. pretty much like, the, the, like, all right, we're going to go. And then <laughs> see you later. We're like, fuck. The guy who taught us about music, we're like, just see you later, dude. Sorry about that. Yeah, and that was the no, beginning of us burning many bridges. <laughs> awesome. That's right. <laughs> the legacy, the Lane Meyer legacy. How it I like how though. everyone in who's been on the podcast or who's part of the New Jersey pop punk group has been in Lane Meyer at one point. <laughs> like, I think that's what brings us all together. <laughs> it's like one giant family. Yeah. <laughs> super, super cool. So in pop yeah, it, it, no, sorry, you gone. No, I was going to say that it was awesome times, man. And like I hindsight, right. I probably, uh, if I go back, cause after, after burning out of music and staying away for it a couple of years, I slowly started to get back into things. I started discovering new bands and, uh, yeah, that really inspired me to start playing again and then dusting off the guitar and, and writing songs again. So that's awesome. Yeah. So just take a hiatus and, uh, it's cathartic. I think if you ever, if you guys do play a show, you should totally cover a true zero song and put that out there. Cause I bet like all those guys would show up and be like, Oh my God, he's going to play. Like I can't, we play it at there. practice. So it's uh, just as a goof. And, um, I've been trying to get them to play. Why'd you say that too? So I could post it to the group. Just oh man. It's, it's amusing to me. You should totally do that. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. But, uh, Hey, we've, uh, we've just been trying to like, you know, again, it's, it's, you know how it's tough getting people together, especially to do something consistent. Oh my like God, I've been yeah. playing with, uh, Tim and this other dude, Mike for a while, but our drummer split town, um, Chris came and, and, uh, Crystal Vecchio came and jammed with us a couple times. Oh really? And he, yeah. And then he, he broke our hearts and split. <laughs> so if anybody's looking or, uh, you know, drummer or bass either way, I think Mike can pull dual duty. So, Hey man, there's a bunch of pretty much the majority of people listening to this live in Jersey. So that's, uh, are you in yeah, Wayne? I mean, are you in Wayne still or I'm in Lincoln park right now trying to figure out what we're going to do. Like oh, we're, okay. we're, you know, we're, two kids and uh we bought a townhouse thinking we're gonna stay here for three years i think it's been like 10 now so we're kind of yeah, you know how it goes yeah yeah i've been renting for my entire life so i have no idea how it goes actually okay so it goes like this you buy something and then you stay there longer than you want to and because... then you grow and then you start building <laughs> growing occupancy with uh, uh exactly people yeah. <laughs> yeah all right back to interesting stuff all right pop kid did you start that um when did that start in in the in this like timeline of, I mean, if i was looking at wikipedia from like left to right and there's a green bar for flip side and then there's like the orange bar for true zero like where does pop kid overlap in there yeah pop kid came after true zero because again like you know you it's just kind of like musical adolescence hey you start working at a record store hey you start a band and then hey you put out a record you know by some band that no one's ever heard of and doesn't sell so that's kind of the timeline i there was um there's a band called playground from davis california um that put out a record that i really really liked and remember yeah. at this time i was writing letters like nonstop. you know every month maximum rock and roll go through the read the reviews if i saw something i like money went in the envelope uh, asked for a record mm -hmm. so i reached out to them like hey i got your your record i really like it uh, you guys have anything else and they said uh you know something like no uh, you know we got a bunch of songs but we're i guess we're we have no plans just yet and then i was like hey you know what these guys are great i should put something out by them and then i just tried to i had no idea what i was doing i, I think i printed up like a thousand seven inches or something stupid so how did you do how did you get the seven inches done though just paid through the nose for him. Like yeah, again, like you can imagine this is it, passion projects are awesome. Yeah. But, but grounding them in some kind of, <laughs> you know, business sense or financial sense will help you do more passion projects. <laughs> yeah. So like, I had no idea what I was doing. I just, you know, got a bunch of money together and, you know, okay, what do we, what do you have to do to put out a record? Well, you got to get a master. You have to get it recorded. Okay. Let's pay a studio, get it recorded. Well, now we got to get it mastered. Okay. Pay for that. Now we got to get it released. Okay. Let's, let's put out a thousand of these. I could sell these. No problem. Yeah. Never thinking like, how do you distribute, distribute records way back then? How do you market like, it? How do you, get how do you market it? Yeah. Like, how do you get reviews? How do you do any of that? Like I had no idea, which is why that if you go to my parents' house or maybe they're at Tim's house now, there's like, you know, probably 963 of these records still sitting in boxes. Jesus. So, that's crazy. Yeah. Like from back then, from like in the early 2000s? Yeah. I mean, maybe we, I'm sure we sold a bunch of them. I'm exaggerating there. But yeah, I've, my garage is full of like pop kid stuff. Tim's house is full of like boxes of pop kid stuff. It's just, we never quite got the, 
the distribution down. And we also had like a kiss of death. Anytime we release something from a band, they always seem to break up. So, and again, you, you could probably attest to this, that it's nearly impossible to sell records for a non, a band that's not touring or yeah. just not doing anything. So, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, is is all are all these releases? Because I remember, um, so I'm looking at the the website and you know, playgrounds on there. It's if you were me, seven inch. That's the first one. And did I guess mm-hmm. they go up? So from bottom to top, it must be every or every a version like one through like the recent releases, or are they all scattered with you know the order they, they came out? Yeah, I, I I would think they're in chronological order, but I'm not really sure. Like I said, Tim takes care of pretty much everything these days. He he okay. picked up the slack when I was kind of you know, just ignoring the label. And now he's, he's got that, the realms, the helm of it. I mean, you got like, for anyone, I mean, he's got like Mr. T experience split with sicko. That's like, never, f- never happened. Never came out. It never came out. No, no, no. Like I, I kind of like got the rights to, they had done a split seven inch and then went out of print. And uh, I worked with Ian at sicko who released it to like, Hey, like, can I get the rights to, and to re-release that with additional songs? And he said, yeah, yeah. yeah. So totally cool. So Sicko had another song they were going to add to it, and uh, we were trying to get the Mr. T experience to record one, and they just like, you know, it just never came to pass. But so, why is it on your site? Uh, it's probably just because we like to catalog our catastrophic failures throughout. <laughs> you know, like this is what led us to ruin. I mean, I remember like Chris had Horace go skiing and Chester Copperpot, and yeah, then no, Star Market. Yeah, the horse, those horse go skiing songs still blow my mind. I, I think they're incredible. You know, Chester Copperpot is probably my favorite record of all time. Like, I just, I love listening to that. Yeah, if and, anyone wants to check these out, just go to popkid.bandcamp.com. There's, I remember Beeswax when that came. And all these, I mean, all my friends, I remember when they would buy these. They like, they loved these records. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I I love them, so I, I hope other people appreciate them too. I remember playing like the Beeswax demos to you and Chris and like. I was yeah. just like so rocked by that one. Yeah, I think it was also too your your passion for those bands too is kind of like um, what is that where uh, it's uh, where someone's excited and it makes you excited. It's like um, addictive almost when you sure. would be excited. I was like, damn man. So like I think contagious. Contagious. Thank you, Christ. Um, I was I was addicted to you and uh, <laughs> feeling was mutual <laughs> until you broke my heart. Until I let you until I crushed right. your soul. That's um, right. Yeah, Ultimate Fake Book with a stereo. Did that one definitely come out? Yeah, that one came out, and I think that's one of the few that we sold all of them. Oh, Aside from the the box of copies that was meant for Jamie and the stereo, like normally the deal wow. with the bands was because we couldn't pay for this stuff. Um, you know, we couldn't. It was you know you couldn't like pay them royalties or anything. So hey, we'll give you like we'll print up three hundred. We'll give you fifty of them for you guys to sell at your local shows. So Jamie's I box, I packed up his. And I don't remember what happened at the time. He was like moving addresses or something. And like they've sat for how many years? Like 15 years, 20 years, whatever it's been. They've been sitting in a box. Still. Still. How did you? I mean, there, I mean the stereo was huge. And both those bands were huge. I think if you put a fucking Facebook out, ad out yeah. and said, like, I have these and took a picture <laughs> and just sent them to like a landing page with a buy now button, you'd sell out of them. Yeah, well, I think we sold all the copies that we had to sell. But again, these were were their copies. So. Oh, oh, they're yeah, fuck them. Yeah, so <laughs> no, 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 it's, they'll they'll stay in that box until we all are dead, and then somebody will find them oh my God. and sell them for billions. So I mean, obviously, it's still now the the record like the label being out now. Like, when what's the last thing you actually put out? What was the last thing? Um, yeah, so we, we put out custody. Yeah, we we put out the custody, the Chestnut Road LP. Um, these are all things, bands that, um, you know, Tim has, has brought to me. And again, it's it's cool the way things work now. It's like this uh, this international network where you just hook up with these other labels and like, hey, I'm going to put this out in Japan. You guys put it out in the U.S. and we'll all just kind of go in on the, the cost together. And it's it's still very, very punk rock and very, very cool. It just doesn't sell at all. Yeah. You know, at least our records yeah. in the U.S., like, they just, they don't sell. And I don't know. Maybe the value is just, the, like, the, the happiness it gives you. You know, it that sounds yeah, stupid uh, and lame, but we, I think that people dismiss that. Yeah, you go into it knowing that. Like, hey, and it's cool, you get a record. I mean, just like when you're in a band, you release a record and you see it, and it's like, hey, this is a, we did this, we made this, this was nothing, and now it exists. Yeah. So it's it's a lot of that kind of pride you put in it. And, you know, when we did Pop Kid just the old-fashioned way, we sold 
we more to other countries anyway. Like we always sold to the UK, we always sold to Japan. We didn't really sell a ton in the US. And then when we do these things where we partner with these other labels, like then they have a direct source to get it in those different countries. So we still struggle with the US, but it's still, hey, shit, our record, our logo's on it, we're part of it. And uh, it's, you know, again, yeah. you pat yourself on the back. And then didn't you come to the name Popkit Records because you saw it as a t shirt or something? Yeah, it's a, there's a band called Senseless Things, which is, a, I guess, an 80s, 90s uh, power pop band. And yeah, they have this. I actually have one of the shirts with yeah. this pop, pop kit on it. And I thought, hey, that's that's super, super cool. And uh, yeah, trying to think of names for the label, that one just stuck. Yeah, and you got it like you got it tattooed on your uh, leg, right? Yes. And well, actually, on my lower back, but you're the only one who knows that. <laughs> no, it's terrible, terrible. <laughs> it is on my leg. That's awesome, though, man. Have you gotten any more tattoos as you've been older? Uh, in your old age? In my old age. there's, You know, I still want to get some. It's just laziness that's keeping me from doing it. But I, I don't really think so. I think it's just the standard horrible Star Wars ones and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, anyone listening, Alan is a gigantic Star Wars fan. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, the Disney thing is funny, too, because I remember... Because, you know, as Facebook, everyone pops up in your timeline or your feed or whatever. And you still, like, go there a bunch, don't you? Yeah. Again, like, it's it's just – we were just said the word addictive before. Like, you know, with uh, I grew up on it going to my family, and now I just – it's cool to be able to take my kids. And, like, you, you – as you get older, you get more cynical, and it's it's yeah. hard to really appreciate or, or the, the wonderment of it all. And yeah. the, the magic gets a little di- diluted, but – you know, you, you, when I brought my son and he watched the Main Street electro, Electrical Parade for the first time and he just he stood like frozen and transfixed on it. And it was just such a cool thing. And, you know, it, Main Street Electrical Parade, if you're not familiar with it, has just like this insane, catchy kind of electric, you know, theme. Yeah. And he loves that. Now he loves listening to that. So we, we listen to it in the car and stuff. And it's just yeah, it's been really cool. Yeah, I can see having kids that could really rejuvenate some youth in you where you're excited about stuff again that it seems obsolete as an adult by yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like you know, holidays and things like that. <laughs> I know, once you grow and turn into a terrible person, like they help bring you back. <laughs> oh, man, I mean, now, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm single and, you know, living in a city by myself. And it's like when holidays come around, I think the 4th of July was a couple weeks ago, or I know it was a couple weeks ago, and I was like, this sucks, I'm bored. <laughs> Like, yeah. I was like, I don't. I mean, obviously, Fourth of July isn't really a kid thing. I mean, like kids like fireworks and stuff like that. But I'm just kind of like, ah. and then Christmas comes around. I'm like, oh, just like hurry up. <laughs> how, how are you single, man? You're so sexy. I don't get it. Thanks, buddy. Uh, I am uh, emotionally damaged from a divorce. <laughs> uh, there you go. That's I just don't. Right. I just don't want to waste my fucking time anymore. I, th- I'm, I know it'll come back around again, but now I'm just like, uh, that sounds like a lot of effort. Man, he's. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> That's the best thing. It's like, oh god, that sounded way too dark. Well, see you yeah. later. No, um, but we're all we're all damaged in our own ways. So I know. Just... I mean, like when I mean, yeah. There's there's this like special attachment to things. Like I think a lot of people, the, there's a youth aspect that people like, but and I've mentioned this a bunch of times when they still. When they're sad that that's gone, it's sad that they're not just living in the present time and enjoying things. But I think there's like. Looking back in the past is great, but then being like bummed out because it's not there is like that just sucks. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's self-destructive. Yeah, you can... and it, it's it's not gonna fucking help you in any way. But I think it's it's cool though when there is a is a present day aspect of like your kids, and then you get to go, man, I get to teach you about you know, these punk bands or Disney World or anything that's exciting to me that was back then, but now it can happen in the present time, but it's also not damaging that I'm missing that time. Yeah, and you, then you get to take your emotional scars and like transfer them onto, you know, 100%. your offspring. Exactly. Yeah, so. You're like, now you'll be damaged in 20 years. Uh, totally. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just kidding. That won't happen. But hey, um, my, this yeah. conversation has been awesome. I would love to talk to you like forever, but I got a jet right now. I totally get it, man. Um, yeah. So, can I ask you one question before you do jet? Please. What punk rock ethics before you go have you still hold on to to this day? What punk rock ethics do I still hold on to? Um, and I have to think of something. The first thing that comes to mind is just being like acceptance. Hmm. Like I, I judge no one based on how you look, how you dress, anything. Like I, you just judge people how you treat, how they treat you. Yeah. And I, that was one thing I always thought was cool about punk rock is like, yeah, I mean, everybody was like crazy and different, like, and entirely the same all at the same time. But like, 
just so positive and again just accepting of everybody no matter what like you come in you be real be who you are like don't put up a facade don't be fake don't bullshit and you are totally accepted like 100 percent like there's 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 no preconceived judgments there's no nothing and to me that's always been punk rock and i still i when i meet new people i, I don't care where you're from or or anything about you i always just try to treat people that same way until they give you reason not to and then you fucking destroy them <laughs> <laughs>